end is to help uh, the people of Kenya to be able to um, live self-determined lives in freedom and dignity. So one of the key questions that you are really going to be interrogating tonight um, is what is the relationship between religion and the state? Is there a link between these two? And if so, what impact is it really having uh, in our Kenyan society as far as um, our, you know, our politics is concerned, as far as you know, social change is concerned? What impact is it really having? If at all there's a relationship between religion and, and our state, you know? So that's pretty much the, the pertinent question that will lead us to unravel, or rather deconstruct if there's really a role that religious actors play in our political um, arena. So uh, without uh, further ado, I'd also like to welcome our online um, attendees. They can participate uh, on our Zoom platform on the Q&A section or, or also on the chat section, the chat box uh, in this Zoom platform or online or on Twitter using the hashtag faith and democracy KE. Uh, you can ask questions, you can send in your contributions. Uh, we'll be, we'll be, we'll, I hope we'll manage to answer all the questions that will be raised. If not, you can still follow up and answer some of your questions online that is on the social media pages. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome our moderator this evening. Uh, he's Reverend Stephen Anyenda. He's the CEO of uh, CICC, that is Coast Interfaith Council of Clare. Uh, based in Mombasa County. And he's going to introduce our panelists this evening and also just drive the discussions uh, this, yeah, for, for this uh, virtual meeting uh, for the next two hours. So uh, welcome Reverend Anyenda and I wish us all fruitful uh, discussions this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sheila, for a very good introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. And I hope that uh, as we share today, we have a group of um, very eminent, very experienced um, panelists. And I do believe that we'll be able to, to discuss this issue of the role in politics and governance, the, the role of religion in politics and governance in Kenya. And as you have heard, my name is uh, Reverend Steven Anyenda. And um, with me today, we have, uh, let me start with Canon. Richard Otieno, um, he's a priest in the Anglican Church, Mombasa Diocese. He's stationed at the SEK or Anglican Church, Mombasa Memorial Cathedral as a canon uh, presenter. He's also the chairman of the clergy welfare in the diocese and also diocesan liturgical coordinator. He is the secretary of NSK Mombasa County Coordination Committee and a member of Mombasa County Interfaith COVID-19 Response Committee. He's also the founder of MODEC Consultancy in Mombasa. And in a moment, he'll be able uh, to speak for himself. The other person I want to bring to your attention is um, Father Gabriel Dolan. He's the Irish missionary priest in Kenya since 1982. He's worked in Turkana. Many of us know Turkana as Lodwa, but Lodwa is the town. He's worked in Turkana. Uh, he's also worked in Kitale in the Transoya County and uh, came to Mombasa in 1982. He founded CJPC in Lodwa, that's Catholic Justice and Peace Commission. And he's also founded the CJPC in Kitale and Hakietu Organization. Um, and he's an active human rights defender and a columnist in National Dailies for 12 years. Um, as we move on, um, I would like to introduce also uh, Dr. Sawe Munga Chidongo. He's a senior lecturer at Puani University. Um, he specializes on African indigenous religion, contemporary theologies, and religion and society. His areas of interest in research include inter-religious dialogue, studying the effects of globalization in Africa and exploring the religious means of responding to the phenomenon. Is also area of research is liberation theology in the African context. And his interest is in Africa politics, economy and governance. My other two 
uh, panelist is Sheikh Omar Abakar. Is he on now? Not yet, but I'm I, being... I do believe as soon as he comes, as soon as he comes in, I'll be able to introduce him. Uh, he's on, but his video is giving him a bit of a problem. But as soon as he comes in, I'll be able to introduce him and also uh, Madam Zbeida Hussein. Uh, we have a lady on the panel. And so as soon as she comes in, I'll be able to introduce them. Uh, lady and gentlemen, just in case she's, she's there, uh, we are looking at the whole question of the role of religion in the politics and governance in Kenya. And because we have such a short time, I've discovered in, in Zoom, the time flies. And um, so we'll, wa we'll want each one of you to take like three minutes after you have said something about yourself, uh, just to uh, get yourself into the role of religion, politics and governance in Kenya and look at what is the relationship between the state and religion in Kenya. And you have like three minutes, so don't go very far in the history and also give us a link between the state of these two concept of religion and governance in Kenya. And so the question is, we are assessing is how, what's the nexus? How do the two play into the politics and the governance in Kenya? Maybe to start us off, I would like us to remind ourselves that in the constitution of Kenya, the first words in the preamble, we find that we, the people of Kenya, acknowledging the supremacy of the almighty God of all creation. But also you find the first words in the national anthem is Mungu. When you say, eh, Mungu, that Mungu is also there. However, chapter two, of the constitution of Kenya, he says, uh, Article 8 says, state and religion, there shall be no state religion. And so, as we discuss these issues, we want to get into what's the relationship between the state and religion, and what impact do we can we see uh, state actors and religious leaders, particularly religious actors in the statehood? Of this nation. So we'll start with Canon. Canon Richard, are you there? Yeah. We appear we lost Canon. Okay, let's get to Father, Father Dolan. How would you start by sharing? Father Dolan. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Uh, I'm the question: uh, What is the nexus between uh, the state and religion? I, I, you know, I think it's obvious is that like we have to understand. It depends on what we understand religion as, you know, uh, because religion is is at once a, it's a private matter because it's your own personal faith, but in all faiths there's a communal aspect too. So it's concerned with about the way you relate to, to your neighbor. But there's a third level also, which is the public level. So there's a public level of, of religion also. So, so you have the private, you have the communal, and you have there's a public level. So, so uh, many people don't acknowledge the third aspect. They believe that faith is a private affair between them and their God, or they perhaps think that it's all concerned about the relationships with their neighbors and the neighborhood and the church and the fellowship. But the critical part too is, is like, it's, uh, there's a public aspect. It's concerned about life and about society. So the public aspect is, there has to be a public aspect of faith. And that's what, where often the clashes come that the state is not comfortable with the church speaking or any faith speaking on society as, as at large. Uh, and I think that's often where the, the conflict comes around. And uh, it's often a conflict too for, for believers because they don't want to engage with the state. They don't want to confront the state and challenge the state when the state has got wrong. And uh, the church often, even the leadership in the church is unfaith, frequently takes the that role of uh, 
been accommodated by the state, of living comfortably, of cozy relationships uh, with the state. So it's it's a complicated issue. I think my three minutes are up, but I could do longer. Are you hearing me? Hello? Reverend? Hello, Reverend okay. again? Yeah, we are hearing you. Yes, I mean, I, I you said three minutes and I timed it, so. I think the moderator has lost. Hello, Reverend Nanyanda, can you hear us? Hello, Reverend. I th okay, we, um, uh -huh. let's, okay, let's just go to Dr. Francis on the same question as, as, as Reverend, uh, Reverend Stephen tries to come back. Just, 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 just give us a quick, uh, maybe, Short, short introduction about yourself as well, and also try to give us the, the nexus between religion and the state and what to think about that. Thank you very much. Um, uh, yes, uh, my name is Francis Kuria. Um, uh, some of you may not have met. Uh, I am uh, right now the executive director of the Interreligious Council of Kenya and also serve as the Secretary General of the African Council of Religious Leaders, Religions for Peace, which is the regional. Uh, 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 expression of the same movement that is there nationally. Um, now, what is the nexus between uh, religion uh, and, uh, and the state? First is that um, the state seeks legitimacy by, by, by patronizing the church or the religious people. In many countries, you'll find that the, 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 the legitimacy of, of the state is many times conferred by, by religious people and religion. Uh, th this is because uh, the, 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 the political leaders want to, to be seen to be acting also uh, as a to us uh, out of the authority of God that uh, the, the, a lot of political leaders um, uh, take the position that, uh, that uh, they, they have a, 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 a divine role or a, 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 a God has a has ordained the affairs of men. And when the, the political leaders are actually directing the affairs of men, they are actually doing it uh, uh, partly because God has mandated the affairs of men to be, to be uh, carried out by leaders chosen or, or selected uh, in one way or the other. So there is that part that uh, politicians do seek uh, the, 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 the legitimacy of religion and religious people to carry out their mandate. Number two, um, the religious leaders themselves, they set the moral tone. Um, uh, the, the, the affairs of the state need to be carried out or are normally carried out within a certain moral tone. So the nexus is that in a situation where the religious leaders are able to pitch the moral tone of the country at the right right level, then you find the political leaders will behave in a certain way. But when the religious leaders are not able to pitch the moral tone for the affairs of the state at the right level, then uh, or they are compromised and they, they look up to the religious to the political leaders instead of looking down at the political leaders uh, and or even at the same eye level, then you find this, the affairs of the state uh, and and uh, are they not carried out properly? And that's why you have countries like Kenya, you have their wrong moral tone and uh, a lot of corruption and robbery because the political leaders do not do not fear, if I can use that word, but do not uh, do not receive rebuke from religious leaders or from other people. Uh, what what uh, Father Donan was talking about this conflict, they, they, they avoid the conflict with the state by actually uh, not setting a moral tone in the affairs, affairs of the state. And, and, and lastly, for some countries, especially a country like Kenya, there are a lot of services that are normally given by the state, which are done or provided by religious people. And therefore, the religious people are partners in the service provision role of government. So sometimes you find that 
Uh, and in some areas, especially if you go to some of these marginalized areas, you'll find the services that the state is supposed to provide is provided for by, this, by religious leaders or by faith institutions. And, and, and therefore, the faith institutions are seen as partners, are seen as collaborators, are seen as part of that service provision uh, infrastructure in the country. And when things go wrong, people will ask, so where were the religious leaders when things went wrong in terms of service provision? Uh, uh, so, uh, in a sense, uh, that is the role. Now, I have done four minutes. I'm sorry about that. Uh, that time will come. We'll Thank come you. to you later. Sorry, I, I, I went out. We'll come to you to that later. We'll, we'll, we'll want you to delve deep into some of those things that um, you've mentioned. I can see Shahomara has come, uh, and we need to yes, introduce uh, With us in the panel is Shahomara Bakar. He's a member of SUKEM. Supreme uh, Council of Kenya Muslims. He's a religious advisor and preacher of the Birds of Paradise, CBO. He's also a patron of Shifa Youth for Development and a motivational and spiritual speaker in higher learning institutions. Uh, and that's great to have you, Dr. Uh, uh, Babakar. Karibu sana. We hope we'll continue. Doing that. Yes. And having said like that, Sheila, where were we before I got lost? Who did you have in mind, Dr. Chidongo? Uh, so doc, Dr. Francis just went, uh, just did his part. So you can maybe go to Reverend Richard because when you when you mentioned okay. him. Now, when I, I, I asked him to come in, he wasn't in. My, okay, Dr. Uh, Richard, uh, Canon. Uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, you have heard, my name is uh, Reverend Canon Richard. Um, in a nutshell, a priest in the Anglican Church. Uh, but also a founder of Modric Consultants. And I'm privileged to have this opportunity to be able to participate in this forum. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. Now, the big question, what is the relationship between the state and religion, uh, particularly in Kenya, as mentioned, and what is the link between these two? Uh, perhaps I'll begin by uh, helping us understand uh, from a broader perspective, that for ages, um, the relationship between the state and religion, and more particularly talking of this uh, between state and church, um, I know that this is a subject that has been studied by many people. But nevertheless, uh, there have been thoughts about this relationship, but the thoughts have changed in the society that we live in today. During the Middle Ages, and more particularly, just to give an example in, in Europe, the Christian religion determined the position of the state as well as the position of the church. And therefore, religion gave state authorities and state powers the legit legitimacy that it has. And the government was the protector of the Christian faith. However, nowadays, allow me to say that religion seems to be no longer that fundamental and the starting point of democracy and the rule of law as it was before. Therefore, freedom of religion and uh, the principle of equality play important roles when we are answering the questions about the meaning of religion in a state. So for me, Religion remains an important factor in the social, cultural, and political domains in the society that we are in today. And it turns out, so to speak, that religion cannot be reduced to a personal conviction as some people may have in their school of thought. And therefore, we can distinguish at least at three levels, the link between the state and religion. The first level that we can be able to look at this is the role that religion plays in the state. We look at the government's role in the religious domain, and at the same time be able to look at the relationship between the state and religion in other several domains, such as formation of political opinion. And therefore, for me, I would want to begin by saying that indeed there exists there exists a relationship between religion and the state, 
and this cannot be separated in as much as other people may have some other school of thought that this can be separated but indeed you realize that there is a very close link between the two and uh, thank you reverend Tanyenda, for giving me this, this opportunity for the introductory part of it thank you very much can we go to Sheikh Omar before we come to Dr. Chidongo? Uh, thank you, Reverend. Uh, I'm humbled to join you in these wonderful sessions, uh, talking about uh, a serious issue that uh, really needs uh, public attention as long as religion is concerned. And state and religion, these are two vital uh, aspects that uh, cannot be separated. Even though, as my a colleague mentioned that, there are various school of thoughts that differ uh, in terms of uh, separating the, the religion and politics, but they go hand in hand. You cannot have a nation without a religion, and you cannot have a religion that cannot take part in contributing to the progress of any given nation. Maybe allow me to give you examples. Uh, in Islam, the uh, prophet Yusuf called him Joseph. He was a prime minister. King Suleiman, Solomon called him, he was the king. And, and in Islam, these are religious people. Uh, these are people who led uh, 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 human beings, uh, but in a spiritual platform, beside uh, being politically at large. So all in all, religion and, uh, and politics, uh, uh, these are two uh, aspects that goes hand in hand, and you can find politics inside even the religion, as long as Islam is is concerned. So these are two things that uh, you, you cannot separate one from the other. They, they are two things that depend on one another uh, uh, towards governance to mention it. Thank you so much in your introduction. For that, we'll get deep Thank into you. that. Thank you so much, uh, Chef Omar. Uh, Dr. Chidongo. Thank you so much, colleagues. Good evening and good evening to the public. I'm really humbled also to, to the participants um, uh, today in today's uh, uh, forum. Um, I have a, a strong view uh, with, with regard to this question about the role of religion and politics, governance in Kenya, but also the relationship. Looking at uh, religion, religion deals with society human beings uh, in terms of faith, uh, beliefs and practices. And also uh, the state deals with the human society. So it's very difficult to separate the two. Even though the other deals with faith and the other deals with the issues of leadership and administration, but the two go hand in hand. And that's why uh, countries like Britain, where we borrowed uh, some, some of the uh, uh, constitution uh, factors, Re religion was actually uh, valued. And that's why religion and society, religion and the state in Britain was together in terms of even uh, looking for leaders. The time came when Kenya became independent. We did copy from that. And if you remember very well that uh, uh, <clears throat> in the beginning, there were religious leaders that were nominated in the parliament in Kenya, but this faded out. Now, today, I find uh, the relationship between religion and the state in Kenya uh, to be worrying myself. It's very, very much worrying. Because uh, uh, it's like religious leaders have been compromised by politicians and also uh, 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 administrative leaders in the government. 
in that uh, they are not as active as they were uh, during the time uh, of Moi, uh, when he was actually too much to the nation. I feel that uh, there is need for, for religion and the state to come together uh, for the development of this nation in every aspect. If not so, then I will just say like what Jen L. Mark said, when religion seeks to understand itself, to verify itself and to account for itself, it must begin with the people's struggles so that they can escape from the hellish circle in which they risk being permanently imprisoned. So we must look at religion then at the ground level and clarify the paths religion can take in the structure of daily life for society. Thank you. Asante sana, Daktari, for starting on that. I, I, I'm coming to all of us because um, we need to discuss it further from where we, 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 we've said. I want to introduce to us Madam Subaira Hussain. Uh, she's the Deputy Coordinator of Supke Mombasa. She has work experience in ad on advocacy on family planning, HIV and AIDS, TB management. She's also Faith Women Peace and Mediation Kenya chapter. She has worked with Southern Sudan, Rwanda, Burundi, women in faith on peace and security and gender-based issues. She's accredited to FEMWISE Africa. Zubaida, you're welcome. Please, will you make your, a short introduction of yourself? And also, on the question that we are uh, discussing, you came in a bit late, but we are discussing what's the relationship between the state and religion in Kenya. Is there a link between these two, or rather, the concept of religion and governance in Kenya? Karibu sana. Welcome. Madam Zubaida. Madam Zubaida, are you able to hear? Okay. Hello. Yeah. Yeah, I'm here. Hello, good evening. I'm sorry, I'm very late. My laptop had issues, it couldn't load. I'm Zubeda Hussein from Sukhya Mombasa. I'm currently working in Nairobi. I'm doing peace work and also advocacy on health issues, family, family planning, health, TB, HIV and AIDS and GBV issues. Currently, I'm working with a community in Zimmerman. This is Roisambo area. This is where I, I do all this. And for the peace work, I've been trained as a mediator. And uh, as for now, we, due to the COVID, we are not moving anymore. We are waiting for things to come down, then we'll start moving around. Actually, on the issue about religion and the governance, to my, in my perspective, religion and governance, religion leaders, the faith-based organizations or re, the, the religious leaders now are like flower girls, as per my view, because we have been called when we things are bad that is when we come in so the relationship with the religion and the and the governance we are we are not felt and i don't feel that we are being involved in so many things we are only needed when things are not good that's my view okay we've had a uh her introductory remarks. And now that moves us now to the next stage for the dollar and I would like, want you to come in. We know for sure Kenya as per the constitution is a secular state. You know, yeah. that's 
chapter two. Uh, and but we also know that the concept of uh, of these two subsystems coexist somewhere. So the question is, um, in our practice of politics and governance in Kenya, are religion and politics too separatable on or in separatable realms? Are they separatable? Is religion and politics different in the governance and politics of Kenya? Uh, thank you very much, Robert. Uh, let me begin by saying is that, um, you know, religion is, is about life. Politics is about life. So religion is really about the whole of your life. And uh, you cannot separate it. And we should, uh, it's not complex. It's not an intellectual issue. It's, it's it, for us, it must, it's real, it's reality. It's, it's, and it's about morality. So it's, it's not like you have two separate categories of religion and then politics. Um, religion is about the whole of life. And it's, it's, religion speaks to life about from the womb to the tomb. It, it, religion, if it's genuine, has to, have, has to speak to every aspect of life, including the political life. So I think that's the first thing I'd say. Uh, secondly is, you know, we should, don't let it become a, an intellectual exercise. And I think most of the speakers already have brought up the issue that, that uh, religious leaders are invisible, are flower girls, as our sister has said. Uh, they're, they're not visible. Uh, and, and I'm particularly thinking of that today without wanting to sidetrack. Today is the 24th of August. 20 years ago, uh, Father John Anthony Kaiser was murdered by the Mai regime and his body dumped at uh, Naibasha 20, 20 years ago today. So, and I knew Kaiser not terribly well, but I knew him and I, I followed the inquest. I've been to court many, many times on the inquest. Um, and, and it reminds me that today, 20 years ago, Kaiser was murdered by the regime. And we can call him a martyr. And people will uh, remember him today. But has any other religious leader of any faith been murdered in the 20 years since? And why not? Or has anybody been detained? And I, I think that is the real issue. That's, that's the real issue because uh, Kaiser took on the pol politicians of the day. He spoke the truth about the ethnic clashes in Enosuperkia and other places. He spoke at the Akiwimi Commission and he defended girls. Uh, and in particular, he accused Sankuli, uh, who was a close associate and an ambassador since of, of mine. So I'm saying is that we are, don't, 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 don't let it not become an academic exercise. Religion and Christianity in, in particular that I'm more familiar with is about living your life and living about the kingdom. So, uh, and I, I'd like to say is that we should ask ourselves is why we've had nobody killed since yet has, has, how much has, has, what has improved in Kenya in the meantime? We have the same problems as Kaiser was, was, was confronting 20 years ago. We have one third of the budget being stolen. We've had 44 billion stolen on COVID. And where are the religious leaders uh, speaking? And, and I think we have to acknowledge that there's something very law wrong in the leadership. There are individuals, but the, the leadership is not there. There are no martyrs nowadays. And, and, and uh, because they're not willing to confront the injustices of the day. Or some may be compromised, Other, others have given up have got tired. Others are concerned about their own institutions and their own church buildings and their own maintenance. And that's a full-time activity. But the reality is, is that it's not, that's, it's not just about politics. It's about justice and injustice. And if there's so much injustice in Kenya, like we have to acknowledge is that um, it, according to Oxfam, 8,000 uh, individuals in Kenya own 99% of the wealth. And we've just reported that 44 billion shillings were stolen. And have I, you know, and all we've seen is a few people protesting here and there. I haven't seen any religious leader. Uh, I know there's one in Mombasa tomorrow. I wonder how many will join us, how many religious leaders will join to protest about that. So it's like, 
it's about the whole of life and and it's about governance and uh in just in these few minutes i'm, I'm wondering is where are the martyrs nowadays uh and they're not there uh, and so become religion as a result will become a very private affair and uh and the church there's no doubt especially if we look at the issue of uh millions and billions of politicians, in particular, the deputy president has been dishing out to the public. The church's silence has been bought. And many churches, it's, it's been bought, it's been compromised. And, uh, and the church suffers the same, and, and perhaps other faiths too, I can't speak on behalf of them. Uh, they suffer from the same issue of ethnicity as much as anything else, uh, as much as any other aspect of society. Um, that's the type of democracy we have. As Jerry Cababeri called it the other day, it's an ethnic democracy. Uh, and the church has not been able to disentangle itself from that. Okay, Father. Even as we move forward and get uh, Dr. Francis to even to put it further, don't you think because Kenya is a secular state and we are we religious people are in, don't you think there are also minorities, other people who are not religious that need to be considered by the state, even as we, we talk about the relationship between uh, the state and, uh, uh, and um, religious. What's the relationship there, Dr. Francis? So, so the, you, you asked two questions. Uh, yeah. One is, is governance and politics, can they be divorced? Are they different frames? Yeah, the that's the first question. And the politics uh, in the management of national affairs. So mm -hmm. governance, is not religious, okay? In the conduct of the governance of the country, you do not need religion, okay? Uh, because it, governance is about application of the law. It's about the application. So the bureaucracy, the bureaucracy that is created out of the political process, then operates with outside the realm of religion. In other words, you do not need any religious um, uh, uh, influence to govern, to govern. In other words, to uh, to um, to to apply the law. So, if you if you if you are, if you are a judge or if you are a, a teacher or you are a you are somebody in in parliament, you don't need. But politics is because it concerns the uh, the, the the optimization of the resources of a country and that affect human beings. Now that is religious. You cannot remove politics from religion and you cannot remove religion from politics because here you are ordering the affairs of men. What, how, what do you prioritize? What laws actually do you make? So the making of laws is a political process. Now that making of law is actually determined by, by, by moral uh, 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 requirements. So the, the law that you make must follow natural uh, moral law. And natural moral, moral law is actually a function of religion. So the political life of a nation is actually dependent on its religious and moral uh, grounding. So if a country has good religious leaders who are actually directing the affairs of the nation, then you have a political process that is good. And then it creates the laws then which can be implemented by a bureaucracy, which is now governance. And that does not require now religion. You can have, you can have a face going to a clinic or going to, to the courts and they get served by the government administrative mechanisms that have been put in place through a political system, which is actually religious and moral in its nature. That will be my, 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 my answer to that question. Uh, Zubaida, what do you think about it, that question? Uh, you know, Kenya being a secular state as per the constitution, but the practice of politics and governance in Kenya, how do you waste the nexus, waste the connection between religion and politics? Are they too separatable or are they inseparable? Madam Zweda. Uh, 
She needs to unmute herself, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, okay, uh, in the nexus of the religion and governance in Kenya, religion and politics appear to be a different source of authority, where religion is identified with the secret, while political governance is identified as profound. But <clears throat> religion institutions rely on patronage. That is why you see the religious leaders and the institution we don't have we don't have a, a say in anything because we are being compromised. Our religious leaders have been comp compromised, and somehow they tend to they end to be corrupt also. So you, you the the nexus between the two we 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 are we are nowhere. The religion the religious is since we 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 tend on to have financial support from the political and the government and the government then. We are being compromised. At times, legitimate violence. Then you get you you the you get the governor. The government can silence you. That 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 pass the I mean the institution can be silenced by the government because of coming out uh, strongly. That is why you see the religious leaders and the religion institutions are playing a very low key. Some fear to be uh, taken away, like the Muslims now. You see, we can't come out and speak because we fear. We, we, we are in that cocoon. We fear when we speak the truth, then they will come after me. OK. OK. We, we are hearing that. And I know, uh, Shah Omar, what do you want to say about that? <laughs> You may need to unmute. Unmute yourself, sir. Kindly unmute. Shahomar, yes, thank you. Now. Yeah. Uh huh. Where, where have you reached so far? What is the issue uh, currently, which you are which you are discussing, please? I was just praying. I'm now back fully. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. We are uh, asking Kenya. Uh -huh. My constitution is supposed yeah. to be a secular state. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And so, but in the practice of politics and governance in Kenya, uh -huh. are religion and politics two separatable or inseparable realms? I'm getting you. Uh, uh, in Kenya, uh, religion uh, and politics are two uh, uh, separated uh, items, uh, calling it. Uh, as you know, in the Kenyan constitution, uh, 20, uh, 2010, uh, we have an article of religion by its own, and also we have an article of politics by its own. Uh, but uh, in uh, when we go to in uh, realistic terms, uh, these are two 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 concepts uh, that uh, can go hand in hand or can interrelate in one way or the other. When we as Kenyans intend to to do politics without uh, identifying and valuing the religion, then we have all gone astray despite the fact of various beliefs in our country. And in Kenya today, uh, religion is being used just for prayer. Religion is being used just when, it, where, when someone is uh, maybe uh, submerging uh, in one way or the other. Religion is used as a way of relief, but not uh, as a way of, uh, of contributing towards the political development uh, in country. So we are in a state that uh, politics uh, is being the order of the day. People sleep politics, eat politics, walk politics, they clothe politics, they do everything uh, in politics, but the religion has been forgotten. 
And you know that uh, politics be it politics, but when you don't introduce the almighty God towards what you are politicizing, uh, call it manifesto, that will that you believe that can uh, can bring can transform the country, can bring the country from one level to the other, but forgetting the religion, then now that politics of yours cannot cannot yield positive positive outcome. That is why we still have a lot of challenges as a country. Yes, we've prospered in some issues. We we've achieved uh, what we have achieved as a country. Still, there are more that that our country Kenya needs to achieve, but not yet. Uh, and when you look down in deep, you can see that religion has been forgotten. The Almighty, they believing in, in supernatural powers. Uh, people have undervalued it. Uh, that is why uh, the country maybe has not enough blessings. The country lack enough masses uh, 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 from the almighty. The country uh, uh, sometimes lose focus in terms of internal challenges. All in all, this has been because of undervaluing religion. But also, uh, you know, religion is an institution that is governed by people, individual people. A religion ha have people who are running it in the country. Uh, we have, you know, even politicians, they were able to bring a new constitution. They are being able to bring a uh, new things, uh, which are good, uh, uh, calling it now and after the other time, because they are using their own political initiative to make the country where it is now. But unfortunately, religious leaders are not bringing in religious initiatives that can bring this country and move this country forward. So we are like a dormant partners in the state. We are not an active religious partners in the state. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you, Canon Richard. <laughs> what do you think? Canon Caribou. Canon, you may need to unmute yourself, sir. Okay, I guess I'm. Sound, sir. Kano, you are muted. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Sorry about it. Okay. I was saying I want to look at it from a, a different perspective also uh, as I make my contribution. I am looking at a political party as an instrument that seeks to get into power and it gives promises to Kenyan citizens. And I want to narrow it down to, uh, to Kenya. So you have a political party that has certain ideologies and the ideologies they have tend to give promises to Kenyan citizens that they want to be able to deliver should they find an opportunity to get into power. And that is what forms a government. So you realize that any government that exists in the day exists in order to be able to provide a wide spectrum of services and opportunities to the citizens of that nation. And I'm also looking at the church or religion as another form of governance that exists, but on a different paradigm. But I may also be able to push the same agenda of offering certain nourishment to the people of meeting particular needs of the following of that particular re religion. And therefore, you realize that there are certain uh, there are certain services being provided by the government that are equally being provided by the church or religion, if you want us to speak about it uh, objectively. And therefore, I want to say that on many occasions, there's, there's tended to be competition between these two institutions. 
And we're talking about the government and the church competing in the sense that each of these existing institutions would want to have certain gains. And as a result, you realize that sometimes you realize there is conflict where the government of the day seems to seem perhaps to come up with policies that will be able to stifle the initiative of religion in attending or meeting the needs of the following. And I therefore I want to say that if you look at it from a wider spectrum and you realize that it is only important that we begin to appreciate that when religion and the state work together, then the benefits are going to be very enormous not only to the citizens of a country, but even to those who form part of a particular religious affili affiliation. And therefore, I want to say that it is only prudent that the two work together. In as much as on many occasions we have seen competition, they've been, uh, we have had a situation where we have the government and the church competing to provide services. And yet we know that if the two would work together, there would be enormous gains. And so I want to appreciate the fact that, yes, it is true that religion exists, but it exists in a society where the government decides what happens in the order of the day. But of course, as we further this discussion, maybe there are other school of thoughts that my colleagues may have, but that will form part of my contribution at this point in time. Uh, Reverend Stephen. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Ichidongo, you've had no, our sorry, argument. Um, we are trying well, to look uh, at. <clears throat> th thank you, Reverend Anyanda. I, I look at it yes, in, uh, yes. in a very different way myself. Uh, Kenya is a secular state. We agree with that. And it means that uh, Kenya has come from far to become a secular state. Uh, probably in the beginning, it was um, a religious state. Uh, whatever it was, be, it, it was. But also we have to understand that religion is, uh, it doesn't exist like a, a, a static uh, institution. Religion is also dynamic. And therefore we have to ask ourselves, is religion also secular or not? Um, in that, because uh, Kenya is a secular state, I, I want to believe that uh, in order for religion to move together uh, with the state, it needs actually to be secular. Uh, secularization is already in Africa. It began in, in the developed countries and it's already here in Kenya. And, and that's why um, you find that uh, there are many uh, factors that have been borrowed by, 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 by religion from secularization. And this one we have to agree as priests, as church leaders, as uh, uh, organization, uh, faith organization, based organizations, that uh, religion is not static. It, it is dynamic. It, it, it moves with change. When people require social change, they follow religion. And that's why in Kenya we've had uh, uh, religious movements. Um, trying to bring in change in society because of oppression, because of uh, different problems, poverty, ethnicity, insecurity, climate change, uh, some, uh, and some others. So actually what I want to argue is that as much as we, we, we say that uh, uh, Kenya is a secular state, for, for religion to move together uh, with a secular state, I think um, it needs also to engage into secularization so that it can work together with the state. But uh, having said that, um, it doesn't mean that uh, uh, religion must be purely secular. It, it just needs to borrow. Uh, I, I don't want to say it this way. For example, uh, uh, the way our, our, our women today uh, dress in churches. It's not like uh, the way Muslims dress, but the way our women today dress in churches. It, it is so, it's so secular. It, 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 it is it sometimes people get disturbed the way uh, our women dress 
and, and they go to church to worship. Uh, as church ministers, we cannot chase them away. We accommodate them. Sometimes we might be in a position to um, um, cancel them and tell them, actually, this is too much. But uh, it comes to a situation where also they demand, they say, my dress is my choice. So the government, in seeing that uh, uh, there is secularization, it takes an opportunity. It takes this opportunity also uh, to, to try to separate, uh, the, the, I mean, to separate religion and itself the state. But I think uh, uh, we need to borrow, but also uh, not everything from secularization. Otherwise, secularization is here to stay. We will not be able to chase it away. Already uh, in many uh, uh, developed countries, secularization has done a lot of damage in, in religion. But at the same time, also we, uh, we acknowledge what secularization has done, especially uh, social secularization. Thank you. And so um, uh, that's great. Now we are going to be, I still have a lot of things. We are bringing things out and you, you've been doing very well. Now I need to ask another question as I'm moving forward. And again, Father Dolan, you will start us off. And I'm asking this question. We need to evaluate the impact that religion and politics have towards each other, as well as the lives of Kenyans. I know we have spoken about this. Some of the speakers here, panelists have um, touched on it. Number A, it will be good to look at the aspect of policy making. What challenges are there that inhibit, inhibit effective influence or contribution of religion in the public sphere? And I know Father Dolan, you had spoken about that because are, are we effective in, in, in the area of policy making or policy change? And number two, are faiths playing their part in changing society? And in what way are we doing that, Father Dolan? Okay. Okay, uh, Reverend. Uh, being the first again, it's 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 it. You put me on the spot, but I, I let me do my best to handle it. I'll try to change I, you on the other question. I, I, just okay, okay. Can I can I just come back to to uh, just on that point of policy? And uh, I'm thinking that like what the Sheikh said there about about the the the, the politicians giving us the new constitution. I I I'd like to disagree on that. Because the, the the politicians and the political class resisted completely. This was a people-driven process. The the constitution of 2010. It was a completely. Uh, it wasn't a political process. It was people-driven from the beginning until the end. So it wasn't like that. It was foisted or forced upon us. It this was people. Um, so that, that's, that's important to acknowledge. And if we go back in the history of, of that process, remember when the two, the uh, Fungamano was, was led by the religious leaders. And it was when the two groups, the political side and the Fungamano came together after Professor Guy insisted on that, uh, as if he was to remain as chair of the CKRC process. Uh, and you, 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 we can know just in terms of policy, just as you were asking, Ofungamana had a huge influence on that. And when the delegates came from the Ofungamana process, Ofungamana was just, was like the people's process and the politicians had to listen. So what we got in 2010 uh, was, was a people driven, not a political process. What we're getting in 2020 is, is a political process. The, two, the constitution was changed by, the, by Kenyans in 2010. Now the political class through the BBI process are trying to reverse that process. And that's why we need the religious leaders to come back again. And I know Dr. Kuria has been uh, assembling many of them looking at these issues along the way. But now that the politicians realize that this was a, a constitution that respected the rights of Kenyans and that reduced their excessive powers, they are now getting into a position where they want to reduce those powers. And we can see many examples like the failure of the president to appoint the 41 judges, for example. So the churches need to be heard again and the faiths and to come together. The Afungamano initiative was, was, was hugely influential in Kenya, very, very influential. And uh, we should be proud of that and, uh, and learn from that and say, it's never too late to go back to Afungamano. 
and I know the the the, the groups that uh, Dr. Curia has been uh, convening over the last couple of years. There, there, there's something in place, even if their impact is not felt. Uh, and so there is need at this time because we're we're getting back to a situation where Kenyans are being told that whether we like it or not, we're going to have a referendum this year. Uh, the former prime minister, uh, Raila Odinga, has been saying that, and Kenyans never asked to change the constitution. So it's like the politicians are forcing that process. So it's time for the church leaders to come back and and say and to stall that process and said, maybe we need to review the constitution, but we're not going to have a forced referendum on, on a BBI that nobody has read, but that we have treated with suspicion. And we have reason to treat it with suspicion. So that's that's why I think in terms of there's a, there's a, there's an entry point there. And another entry point for religious leaders is the whole issue of, of massive pan, the pandemic cor corruption and endemic corruption. Um, that it, there is need for for people of faith to have outrage, to be really really angry, and to mobilize the people just in the same way that they they've been mobilized peacefully in 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 Mali to protest and say this is not good enough. When people when you steal public funds, when you steal the COVID money, you're killing Kenyans. This government is killing its citizens. What more do we need to, to, to be angry and to be awake and to be awake then? And the, the major role of any faith is to awaken people. People are asleep. People are asleep. Kenyans are asleep because they've been anesthetized by this government because corruption has become so uh, endemic so normal. And it has also, unfortunately, infiltrated into religious institutions that are also have been corrupt. But, the, but it's never too late to, to, to revive that voice and to awaken the people and say, this Kenyans are dying because money has been stolen. This is Thank a crime Father. against humanity. Yeah. We are coming to that. We'll come to that. Uh, Francis, you are mentioned. Uh, Dr. Francis, you are mentioned into by Father. Can you pick it up from there and then see what you, you have to say? Yes. W what I can say is that, as I had mentioned earlier, the uh, policy formulation, policy development, and policy implementation, there are three parts in policy. So in policy formulation and policy development, it is a political process and religion must play a role. The biggest policy, the most important policy we have in Kenya is the constitution. It's a policy document. Uh, coming from the constitution, the, gov the, 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 gov the country always develops session of papers to drive policy development in the country. Those session of papers, whether it's a session of paper on education, it's a, paper, a session of paper on employment, it's a session of paper on, um, on environment, it requires the thorough input of religious people. So religious people are always involved in policy formulation and policy development. Now, they, 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 they have a minor role in policy implementation because policy implementation is that those policies are translated into laws. And the role of religious leaders, as Father Dolan has said, is to be an oversight, is to actually not leave the, the bell tower, not to leave uh, the episcopal uh, uh, responsibility of staying awake, watching the policy implementation, whether it's the constitution, whether it's a normal law, whether it is regulation, whether it is a, 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 a bylaw created by, by county assemblies, whatever policy implementation processes are put in place, then the religious people and citizens win their sovereignty. And citizens are religious people themselves are supposed to watch and ensure that policy implementation. So is the constitution being implemented faithfully? Now, if it's not implemented faithfully as the citizens decided through a process that is political and therefore injected with religious beliefs and religious values and the moral foundation that the religion is supposed to create for the country, then the religious leaders are supposed to say, no, you are doing it wrong. You are not implementing the constitution. If it's another law, if it's anti-corruption law, if it's a procurement law, 
if those laws are not being implemented, if the, 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 the people have been put in charge of hospitals and cancer, they are implementing a law, a policy guideline, a law in the form of procurement act. They are supposed to implement that law. They're supposed to receive money from treasury, which, is, which goes to them following an act of parliament in the budget. That act of parliament is a policy document. They're supposed to implement it. Now, in the implementation of that, the problem we have in this country is that the citizen sovereignty and their oversight capability has been compromised. And one of the ways which the, 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 the has been compromised is the securitization of policy implementation, such that citizens are unable to oversight the governance structures that they have put in place due to securitization of policy implementation. And that's why you have the police arresting protesters, arresting people who go to, 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 to picket, arrest, uh, beating people senseless, when they are in disagreement with the governors and the, the, the administrative structures that have been put in place to actually implement policies that have been developed through a political process. So the, 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 the problem we have in Kenya is securitization of policy implementation. Policy implementation should, should be oversighted by citizens. And that citizen oversight must be facilitated. That's why we, we talk about citizen participation in, in policy implementation. So when, you, when any governance structure wants to implement any policy, they must ensure that the citizens are involved, the, part, the citizens participate. When they fail, to ensure citizen participation and citizen input and citizen oversight, then the religious leaders are required, are by, 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 by their position, they need to wake up and tell the people, no, that is wrong. So like in this case, Father Dolan was mentioning about the, the, the governors who have been put in place since 2010, especially since 2013, have actually been reversing the gains in the constitution which is the major policy documents of this country. And that policy document was put together with very, very heavy input, very heavy input by the religious leaders. But the religious leaders have not uh, so far spoken out as clearly as they should. They have spoken out, but not as clearly as they should, uh, uh, re uh, telling the governors, the people who have, who have been uh, 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 seconded to implement that policy document that what they are doing is wrong. You cannot reverse the gains. You cannot uh, undo the decision of the citizens uh, by failure to implement the constitution, Thank which is a policy document. So, so you, you, I hope now you, you see the, the difference. There is policy formulation and there is policy implementation. And policies start from the constitution to normal laws, to, to, uh, to regulations or strategic plans or other administrative instruments for policy implementation. Thank you. I want to hear a lady's voice. Madam Zubaida, <laughs> are you still there? Madam Zubaida. Okay, while we are still looking for her, Canon Richard. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity once again to contribute to this. I would want to say this, that across the globe and with a critical examination from one country to another today. We know that societies are very much bedeviled by myriads of problems. And indeed for me, such problems span all areas of human endeavors today, be it political, be it social, be it economic, be it cultural, to mention just but a few, be it religious, matter security, just to add on to the few points that I have actually been able to mention. And therefore, it is important, even as we make a contribution to this subject matter, to understand that over the years, human beings, through their various governments, engage one major and potent instrument, which is called policy. And therefore, the, the issues of policy are very much prevalent in order to address and solve problems 
of societies and issues that affect the citizens of a nation. And therefore, policy processes that the government may initiate must ensure that there is utmost participation from different actors. And this means that, that even in religion, churches must be able to participate. If we're talking about you know, religious formations, they must be able to participate in terms of you know, policy processes. So these actors or participants are crucial because they are very influential people in terms of you know, policy implementation. And therefore, it is important to understand that religious leaders have a role to play in making sure that we give our contribution to any policies that are being made, be it in parliament by parliamentarians, we need to participate. And that's why you realize that the government in itself has continued to reach out to various actors to give in their input on issues that they know will be able to affect their day-to-day -day lives. And therefore, it is only prudent that different actors participate in policy formulation, participate in terms of policy implementation, because they know in which particular areas people are affected. We are religious leaders today. We interact with many people. We have huge following and we do understand the challenges people go through, the challenges that our followers face. And therefore, if the government comes to the policy that is going to affect our followers in a negative way, then that will pose a challenge. That's why if you realize that different actors oppose certain policies that the government would want to implement without allowing participation. And therefore, it is only prudent at this juncture to say, Reverend um, Anyenda and the panelists, that it is incumbent upon the government to ensure that different actors participate in, in, in matters policy making, in matters policy implementation. Even though sometimes I see that when given opportunity, we also tend to not do the right things. And when we don't do the right things, then the government comes in. And what happens? There is coercion in terms of implementing certain things that may work to our disadvantage. And therefore, so I, and therefore, I wish to stop by saying it is important that different state actors be involved, different actors be involved in terms of policy making and policy implementation. Thank you, Sheikh Reverend Omar, Anyanda. Yes. Please. Okay, Sheikh Omar, I'm going to give us now two minutes each so that we are able to discuss other issues also as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Reverend. Uh, maybe I start with my colleague father uh, when he mentioned that uh, people are the ones who are bringing changes, for example, constitutionally. Uh, but in terms of policy making, uh, you know, policy making, uh, a policy on its own needs public participation. And uh, for you to have a public participation, you must have an, an influence uh, that can enable that policy uh, be passed to law. And all these things in Kenya happens uh, politically. You know, we need to be realistic when we are talking about policy making in Kenya. And uh, for us religious leaders, we are among the, the, the dormant, the inactive partners in terms of policy making in Kenya. Uh, Father uh, mentioned about uh, a prominent poli uh, politician who talked about referendum, uh, 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 that is that it will happen, okay? And believe you me, he mentioned it uh, because uh, maybe uh, he has he has tools, he has the numbers, okay? When 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 we talk about the numbers, it means the followers, the people, okay? In Kenya now, uh, you if you want to be heard, you must have people or the number. If you want to uh, to pass your agenda for the country, you must have people and the number. 
this is the reality to the ground. But unfortunately, religious leaders don't, have, they have people on the number, but they use material for, for their own personal gains. Let us call a, a, a spoon a spoon, not a big spoon. Let, let us call, I mean, a spade, it is a spade, not a big spoon. Most of religious leaders in Kenya, greediness, uh, materialistic uh, individuals, they mainly depend on charity from their followers, but they don't uh, uh, implement what their followers are anticipating to them. Uh, last but not least, you know, in Kenya now, anything, it cannot happen uh, through spiritual uh, arena unless we make a positive push. You cannot say that we need to wait to be called to be among the actors. No, this is our country. We, we have a stake in this country. We have a big share in this country. We are among the millions of Kenyans in this country. We cannot wait to be called to be among the actors, but we are actors automatically. So we need to stand firm, still, fair, with all wisdom to ensure that we take part and contribution towards policymaking by mobilizing our followers and also taking seats on all appropriate channels that can make our, uh, the policy of this country be harmless, be useful, be of benefiting to the common monanchi or all Kenyans that can be uh, transformed uh, to laws. So uh, Reverend, uh, that's my take about policy making. Thank you, Omar. Uh, Dr. Chidongo. Thank you, colleagues. And, and because, uh, you're I'll professor, I'll give you, because you're a professor, I'll give you two minutes. <laughs> thank, thank you so much. I, I actually, I appreciate uh, all of you. Um, the, the debate on uh, uh, whether religion should be engaged in the policy formulation and the policy making is very crucial. And I want to appreciate uh, Father Gabriel very much because um, I, I remember the time when uh, uh, the, the regime of Moy, when things were so bad, uh, Kenyans came out um, and they were led by religious leaders. And uh, this is what formed the, the Kenya we want. There was what we call Citizens Coalition for Constitutional Reforms. And uh, this was uh, supported by uh, Roman Catholic Church. It was sponsored by the Roman Catholic Church and NCCK. And, and people actually were able to come together um, and discuss about the reforms of the constitution. Eventually we got the 2010 constitution, but this was also through the efforts of religious leaders. But after that, after that, uh, religious leaders relaxed. Now they did not actually engage themselves into the implementation. And that is where we find the gap. They did not engage themselves into the implementation. Instead, the implementation was left to the politician, politicians. And that's why we find that uh, the politicians have found a weakness in us. And they are doing what they are doing today because we are asleep. Religion is a sleeping giant in this country. And uh, I want to, 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 to say that unless we become active in uh, uh, the implementation of the policy, we will continue to cry. And citizens of this country will continue to blame religion, be it Islam, be it Christian, be it Hinduism. We need actually to be active enough for whatever is happening in this country is because of our laxity. If we were vocal enough, like the way Mutafa Musimi was vocal during those days, but what did he do when he went to the parliament? He kept quiet. If we were vocal enough, like the way Reverend Timothy Njoya was vocal during those days, but when the 2010 uh, uh, constitution was available, what happened? And I remember he was also interviewed one of the days, that where, where are you now? He said, I have retired and I'm giving this opportunity to youngsters. But where are the youngsters? Where is Reverend Tanyenda? 
Where I'm is here. Dr. Francis Kuria? Where is Sheikh Omar? We want the likes of, uh, uh, of Mohammed Balala, who came out strongly and called a spade a spade, not a big spoon. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Daktari. I see Zubeda, you are back. How can you contribute on this uh, in a, maybe in a minute or two? Um, the question is, we are asking is uh, to evaluate the impact of religion and politics and what it has towards each other in the lives of Kenyans. And particularly when we are looking at the, uh, the aspect of policy making. Are faiths playing their rightful role in changing uh, society? Zubeda. Zubeda has said, if you look at the chat, that she's unable to continue uh, okay. her net as well. Actually, there are also questions. You, there are 31, yeah. uh, there are quite a number of questions, but in the chat, Zubeda said that uh, my network is failing me, Poleni Sana. Nimeyona. <laughs> Nimeyona, I was just trying to see whether she's able to, but I will now continue. The rest of us will continue. Let, let's look at the three questions. Very, very, very quickly, people have said, uh, if, if all of us can go to those questions, as we answer, as we participate in these other areas, can everyone see the questions? I hope we can. Yeah, at yeah, least, we do. Yeah, so that when we are contributing, please, um, you can also do that. I'm going to ask three things at a go. And the first thing I'm going to ask, uh, if you have a pen and a paper, maybe that's good. And Father Dolan had touched on this, and I think many of us need also to, to pick that. Francis, you have also touched on that, is what's the influence of religious actors on public participation in our beloved, in the devolved government system? And how do we help? How does the religious people help the public understand why it's important to take part in public participation forums, despite our religious convictions? Do we ever push our people to get involved in pub, uh, public participation? And, uh, and I know there was a question from Father Dolan as to how many people of us will be on the streets. Uh, do people, uh, do we have influence enough for people to believe in us. The second one I want us to look at is our, does our religious conviction have a role in Kenya's political elections? Do we influence voter behavior and patterns during elections and referendums? And if so, it will be good to get more elaboration on this. How do we influence the convictions of our Kenyans uh, political election and the behavior of the vote, uh, of the voter patterns. And lastly, I want us to, call, to contribute on the issue of religion and political mobilization. It looks like what I've just asked. Um, do we have an ideology? Do we are we able to convince our people because of our faith that? Uh, this is how we as an African country can be able to mobilize towards something. How do people identify? How do people use the identities of faiths in political mobilization in Kenya? Those are very many things I've asked, but I'll give each one of us, uh, we are very few minutes to go. I'll give each one of us three minutes, run like Kipchoge over these things. And I think everything will be right. <laughs> Let me start with Francis. I started with Father, Father Dolan the other time. Let me start with Francis at this point. Premiers. Okay. First of all, to answer the people uh, who have asked questions, uh, including Gloria and also uh, in the chat, yes, unity uh, in diversity is important uh, in actually uh, channeling the, the, the resources and the social capital of religious leaders to effect change in the country. And uh, this is what we have been trying to do in the Interreligious Council of Kenya. And I believe we are getting there. Now, to come to your questions, number one, uh, are, are in terms of evaluation. Now, here you have to look at efficiency and, and, the, and the effectiveness and then the impact, or, uh, whether they have had impact. Um, I don't think they have had impact. I don't think the, the governors are listening to the citizens in the implementation of policy in Kenya. 
and therefore I, I would say that uh, it, on a mark on a grid of uh, of uh, zero to zero to ten, with uh, zero the lowest and ten the highest, probably the religious leaders would give them a three in terms of their impact and their efficiency and effectiveness in ensuring public participation. Um, are we are we able to 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 influence voter behavior? Um, I remember uh, once there is a the former Secretary General of uh, EAK. Uh, um, uh, he, 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 he said that uh, during elections, uh, the voters leave church and go to their tribal kayas. Um, no, the religious leaders in Kenya have not been able to, to influence voter behavior. Voter behavior in Kenya is 98% um, influenced by tribe and people vote according to tribal lines. Um, uh, even even the, for the Muslims who are actually have a stronger bond, um, even the 2007 20, election, the, the memorandum of understanding between uh, the then uh, ODM party and, and NAMLEF didn't uh, uh, translate into votes. The Republican party at the coast uh, did not translate into votes for Balala. And he was he was really being being pushed by by religious actors uh, uh, to, to to on that vote. So no, religion does not translate into votes in Kenya. Not yet. Uh, do we have an ideology? Um, not yet. I don't think religious inst organizations and institutions have developed uh, the political narrative of their faith institutions so as to 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 create an ideology which then is woven into the political manifestos of the various political parties in Kenya. Is it a desirable thing? I don't think so. I, I think uh, it may not be desirable that uh, that religious uh, ideology and uh, and priorities and uh, and uh, and and things are woven into the political uh, parties that we have because the the the, the danger of uh, of our, of our political parties uh, 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 closely interwoven into the religious beliefs and ideologies of anyone. Uh, uh, religious group is very is, is 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 the danger in the divisiveness of that is very high. Therefore, I would I would imagine that the best place for religion is to act as a moral compass, the moral foundation, uh, the natural law to influence policy making, and 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 uh, in the in the creation of laws and 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 strategies and and uh, programs for the well being of Kenyans. That is a better mechanism than trying to interwoven religious ideology into the political life or into the politics into the uh, into the into the into the manifestos of political parties that would be my answer thank you uh, i'll go to canon would you come in quickly i'm i'm keeping father on the standby he'll he'll be the next one come uh, he'll come after mark uh, thank you two minutes canon okay thank you um i wish to quickly state that uh uh, taking us back to uh, the, late, the, the, the 1990s, uh, when we are asking the question as to whether uh, religious, um, uh, religious convictions uh, have influence in elections. Yes, I want to say to some extent, uh, because as we take you back to 19, early uh, 1990s, you realize the Catholic Church, for example, just to give an example, <clears throat> uh, its leadership uh, came up with uh, various initi initiatives uh, in order to do uh, to support uh, constitutional reforms. And this was clearly uh, in support of the democratic opposition, which was in existence then, okay? And so you realize that in advancing this course, they had a certain agenda, right, during that time. So this was clearly in support of that democratic opposition committed to defending human rights and which offered an alternative to the Moy regime, as we all know, those of you who, have started, who, who can be able to recall that. But look at it in 1992, when Kibaki, who is, also, who is a Catholic, seemed to be their favorite candidate, okay? It's moderate and the conservative stance were perceived uh, as guarantees against excess, you know, excesses that were feared to be the hallmark of a ruling class that time, okay? So the top clergy in the Catholic Church knew the political elite very well and they harbored distrust for its motivation and capacity then. It therefore advocated for reduced powers of government that was increasingly absent. So 
support for, Mo for, for, for President Kibaki from the Catholic leadership was a nationwide thing. But today, this support, uh, we can see, is not there. For, for any person who aspires to be in leadership position, you realize that, you, uh, particularly at this point in time, this support is, is not there. So I want to say that religious uh, organization, to some extent, have an influence uh, when it comes to matters elections, because we have a huge following, as one of us had said, we have the capacity to convince. That's why you realize that we have politicians getting into churches, tend to influence church leaders in order to be able to get votes from them. Therefore, to some extent, we can say that, yes, religious formations have an influence when it comes to matters election, because this is clearly seen uh, in what happened with the Catholic Church. And also, of course, we have... I, to conclude this, uh, Reverend Tanyada, also looking at the, the Anglican Church, when election times come, you realize that many a times our religious leaders, to some extent, have certain political affiliation. And because of that, they tend to do a drum support for political leaders of their interest in such a manner that you realize they, have, uh, they take the platform to convince the following, okay, the Christians, to vote for a particular individual that they seem to have interest in. And therefore I can say in a nutshell that yes, to some extent, religious institution organizations have an influence in matters election. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's allow uh, Omar to come in and then Father Dolan. Uh, okay, thank you, uh, Reverend. Uh, for the first question uh, on public participation, we do have influence as religious leaders on public participation. And uh, we, have to, we have to take part in it fully. We have to take part in it fully uh, so that uh, our view, uh, views uh, of the people uh, and their demands uh, can be heard positively and equally. Other thing in regard with uh, taking part in Kenya, Kenya's political election, uh, religious leaders and institutions uh, I think are mandated uh, to educate their members or followers about the qualities uh, of a good leader. Okay, I think they need to, to, to act as a guidance, not to directly pinpoint a, a politician that he is good enough, no, but at least to, to give their followers guidelines, uh, guidance and the qualities of a good leader to whom uh, they will elect and consequences uh, that it has for electing, uh, an, I mean, a leader who is unqualified. Uh, the, the, uh, for, the, for, the, for the religion and political mobilization, uh, we as religious leaders uh, can, can give out good ideologies, uh, benefiting ideologies to political affiliation, uh, affiliations nationwide. At least we can take part uh, 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 on their manifesto uh, 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 and chip in to give more ideas beside theirs. Uh, at least that if any political party has passed and former government, it can lead this country uh, in the right direction. But Thank I think in my view, I think in my view, lastly, uh, it's quite unfortunate if we as religious leaders uh, uh, to, to side with one political party and to support it. We need to be nonpartisan uh, in terms of uh, 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 political parties. If maybe it happened that they have quarrels and there is havoc, confusion and hostility and, and fight inside the country, we can be part and parcel of uh, being policy makers. But if you support a Thank political you, party Mama. now, then it will be hard for you to be a policy maker. Thank you, Reverend. Asante, time is really running, Father Dolan. Yeah, it's okay, it's okay, no problem. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, let me just come back to some of the questions and the comments. Um, uh, thank you, Shamala, for your kind words in one of, in one of the uh, comments. And uh, that question, like how can the churches and the religious faiths be prophetic? I mean, that, that is the great thing, you know? I mean, uh, because the, the, the great difficulty that we've seen with Kaiser and everybody else and anybody who's been prophetic is that, is that 
if you're a prophet, first of all, you're going to be rejected because you're speaking the truth. And the majority of, 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 of the public, including our own uh, faithful, can't cope with the truth. They don't want to hear the truth. So uh, it's like in the case of Kaiser, like, remember, Kaiser didn't have a whole lot of support when he was, when he, when he was alive. But he's a hero and dead uh, when he's dead. So when prophets are dead, as I've written today, when prophets are dead and silent in the grave, then we, we treat them as martyrs. Uh, and and, and that's, that's a great disappointment. And I think there have been other comments there about where the churches have been and the faiths are in, in bed with the government. I think it's very true. Um, it, it's, it's very true. It's very difficult to distinguish it be, because of... Uh, Many, many religious leaders are, are, are in bed. They're, they're, they're the occasional voice, uh, but, but to the leadership is, is, is extremely weak and, and certainly not consistent at the moment. Uh, as regards elections then, I mean, I'm not taking them in the order in which you asked. I think like I agree with Korea is that ultimately our democracy has failed Kenyans. Democracy has not brought change. It, it's because Basically, uh, 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 people vote, as he said, 98% of people vote. It's an ethnic democracy. It's ethnic, it's ethnic democracy to vote. But that isn't the fault necessarily of the people. That's the fault is that politicians have hijacked the whole political process. And it's really difficult for anybody to emerge at the grassroots at any level, even to be uh, an MCA. It's extremely difficult uh, to be an MP. If you're not part of those elite mafia who are controlling political parties at the, at the moment, so so it's it's often like the question is: Is it even worth voting at all? Because the choice is is so poor. Not because that there aren't people there, but because they're not allowed to take part in the process. So democracy has failed to give us the leaders. But that is not to say that Kenyans, I think, are are tribalistic. I think in it's in that situation, then it's it's it's. A, it's choice of poor evils, uh, the best of the evils. So you choose your own. Um, uh, so I, I think I'd have to say that. And uh, as regards public participation, I think in, in, in Mombasa, we have seen the difficulties that it took uh, six years to have a public participation bill. Father, I'm giving you two minutes. Yes, I, I, we finished in two minutes. It took it took us it took us all it took us five six years to get even a public participation bill, and it was only passed last year, where there was a role. Nowadays, even today, you've seen is that the finance the 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 the, the budget for next year, that they published it today in the newspaper, saying, "Oh, if you want to come and send send a, mem a memorandum, which you don't even know would be acknowledged." So the political. The political, uh, as, as, as Curry also said, like the, 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 the governors and the county government administrations have resisted public participation. But where people have challenged it, it ch changes are coming. And it's gradually getting into the minds of the people that they have, they have input into this. Um, and I do, finally, I'd like to say on this is that we don't, you know, don't always look for, for sheikhs or priests or bishops or pastors or reverends to lead. The calling from, from the religious leaders is for everybody. You know, it's for everybody. Don't always, if, if, if your religious leader is not, it has, is, is, is in bed with the government, doesn't mean you have to be, because ultimately it's your conscience and your relationship with your creator that matters that you have to decide. So people have to take a stand and not want necessarily to be waiting for individuals we need we need people of every good people of every faith and every religion to be active if it's good don't be just waiting because they're not there at the moment they're certainly not there thank you so much we want to thank uh, i've been looking at the question and answer and also on the chat and i know our our participants have really been looking at them and answering them. If you've been listening, they have been picking that and answering some of those things. And I hope they have uh, addressed some of those things. I want to thank so much, uh, Dr. Francis Curia, Canon Richard Otieno, Father Dolan, Shah Omar, uh, uh, Madam Zubaida Hussain. And at this point also, I want to thank um, Dr. Sawe Munga Chidonga and give him two minutes uh, to give remarks on those things I had said. And after he has finished, Sheila, please take over. Thank you so much and have a good evening, Dr. Chile. Thank you so much, uh, Reverend Tanyenda.
I want actually to appreciate all what you have said with regard to the influence of religion uh, in, in, in elections and uh, also in public participation. I think uh, it's very important that uh, we have to remember that uh, um, the church uh, has done a lot in, in the beginning uh, by making sure that uh, uh, the, the, the church educates um, the society, especially on the side of uh, voters. And this was a, a great uh, step for, for the church to do that. The NCCK has been doing that. The Roman Catholic has been doing that. And also uh, Islam has been doing the same. Uh, but when it came now to the recent uh, devolved governance, I think uh, uh, we also uh, did a bit of slumber. We, we slept a bit. But I think there's need for us to revive again and make sure that uh, we educate our, our people. Um, public participation is very important. In whatever is being done in any society, people must be informed on uh, what decisions they must make uh, so that they can, uh, they can be in a position to live a better life. Without that, the country uh, would be in a mess mm -hmm. because people will not be informed at all. So I want to agree with all the members and I want to say thank you so much also, uh, but I want to uh, conclude by saying that let us unite as religious people. Let us be people of interfaith and interfaith dialogue. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you so much, panelists. Sheila. Okay, thank you very, very much, all of you for your great insights as far as this topic is concerned. But before we all go, I'd like all of us to, all of you especially, now that you're experts in this field, to just give a parting shot. But there's this question that, parting shot is based on the, this question that was raised on the Q&A platform, um, actually by Gloria from CACC. Um, there are many faith institutions in the country and other civil societies, but they never work together. For faith to be effective, unity among faith institutions is important. So how can unity among the faiths be built? And the reason as to, as to why I want us to, to like uh, answer this as we give a parting shot is because um, there's one thing, one thing that I picked from most of you and uh, that religion has somehow, um, what can I say, I don't want to say failed the people or there's like a disconnect somehow with how uh, you're relating or rather how you're impacting you know, the society, whether it's for social change or even uh, when it comes to uh, educating the public on so many different issues as far as uh, participating you know, in our politics is concerned. So I just want us to think about that question and then you give, you answer it or rather give a quick reaction as you give a parting shot. How can you really come together and work together and have a force, that strong force that used to be there uh, some time back that really, you know, uh, brought that, you know, some, some, some milestones or rather some steps as far as our democracy is concerned. So we'll start with Dr. Sawe uh, Munga Chidongo. Just what do you think, how can we- so much organizations or religious uh, work together? My, my view is that to, um, as religious uh, people... You have one minute, so, sir. Just yeah, one minute. We, we need to come up with a, with a amicable uh, methodology. Uh, for example, in my view, I feel that we need to uh, come up with inter-political and inter-religious dialogue. We also need to work together with the, the, the national uh, uh, cohesion team so that we bring people together in this country. But religion must bring people together. For people to come together, religions must unite for now. If we don't unite, things will be in a mess. Thank you. Okay, uh, Sheikh Omar. Uh, we as uh, religious institutions in Kenya, uh, we have uh, the, the authority of making sure that our country continue progressing well economically and in all aspects of growth. We can do it by ensuring that we partner with all relevant stakeholders, be it be politicians, be, be it be businessmen, be it be civil servant, we should all work together and not uh, portray ourselves as inactive people in our beloved country, Kenya. Thank you. 
Dr. Francis Kurim. Yes, uh, as you know, I've spent the last uh, 15 years of my life trying to build the Interreligious Council of Kenya into a formidable uh, interreligious group um, uh, to be able to speak with one voice. Exactly what you're talking about, we have tried to do it in the Interreligious Council of Kenya. Uh, we have now uh, nine of the main faith groups in Kenya uh, working very closely together. We are going to be uh, uh, including some two or three others in the coming within this year. Uh, we have also established uh, 34 local interfaith networks all over the country, except for the coast where the CSC have been helping us in, in that collaboration. Um, we have uh, developed the Africa, uh, the, the Kenya Women of Faith Network to bring the women of faith together. We have developed the, the Kenya Interfaith Youth Network to bring the youth together. So we are doing uh, what we can right now. The biggest challenge, of course, is uh, that uh, uh, you would expect that religious institutions uh, may have a bit of money. The, 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 the many religious institutions have a lot of money, but unfortunately, it has been very hard to bring money from the religious institution into the common pot for them to be able to work. So, the fundraising challenges of the interreligious of Kenya are great. To be able to to, to create that synergy of voice, you need a bit of resources because in, for anything you talk about, you need to to be able to bring people together, to be able to talk. Like to, uh, on Wednesday, we have uh, we are bringing together uh, 35 religious leaders uh, in order for the dialogue reference group to be able to discuss just on this uh, on the issue of the of that generation formula and uh, the COVID uh, resources. So it is very expensive process. Interreligious dialogue and bringing religious leaders together is a very expensive process. We have tried. I believe there is a lot of work to be done still. Uh, so that is what is required. You require a strong central institution uh, uh, with, the, with, the, with all the members of the, all the faith groups uh, creating enough and adequate space for interreligious dialogue and creating joint programming uh, and joint actions. Uh, this is what is going to propel. It has been done. It's not something we are starting. It's been done in many other countries. We have done it to a large extent. Um, but, uh, we still need uh, a, a bit of a push, a bit of a, an agreement at the top. Um, at the top religious leaders, we need we need to see because uh, the top uh, of the religious leaders uh, to be able to create that the momentum that we need. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Reverend Canon Richard. What do you have to say about uh, yeah? How how can the religious actors, faith-based organizations, you know, come together, unite, and work as a force so that we can continue to, you know, to inform and to educate our public so that, you know, um, our democracy can make more strides. <laughs> Thank you. Already, uh, these um, uh, interfaith formations exist. So it's not even a question of us, you know, forming them because they already are in existence. What is needed now is our proactiveness in terms of advancing our causes. And then the second thing I would want to say is that it is important for religious formations as we seek to work together to identify common challenges, common areas of interest, and to put our energies in there, even as we appreciate our diversity. But so to speak, hitherto, these formations are already in existence. We only need to be more proactive and we must not allow ourselves to be compromised because one of the things that would actually help uh, would normally pose a challenge to this formation is the fact that many a times we are compromised. And why do we get compromised? It's because we have certain interests. When we have political parties or political, we have certain political masters, you know, who find their way into these formations and they kind of want to manipulate these formations because they have certain interest in them. So we must be able to stand firm and drive that particular agenda that we need to drive for the common good of all Kenyan citizens. So that is my parting shot at this point in time. And thank you for this opportunity. Right. Thank you. Uh, Father Dolan? Yes, uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for the engagement. It's been very lively and very interesting. Uh, and, I, and I've noted that like we're talking about cooperation at different levels. Uh, the work that Curie is doing with, with, with the, the heads of the religious and then CICC and others are doing more locally. But there's another level and I think that is, which is just as important and, it, it, and that is 
working for social justice. It that it it's it we can have a lot of great meetings and dialogue and seminars for religious leaders, but it never quite gets the, and the religious leaders can have great cooperation together, but they then it, it may not reach down to the grassroots level. What I'm talking about is what happens when religious leaders can come together when uh, for example communities are threatened with eviction, when there's illegal evictions. Uh, which happens all over Kenya, has been happening in Nairobi, it has happened in Mombasa, and many other towns and even rural areas. When, the, when they're working and determined to have a voice for, for, for the deprived groups, for the slum dwellers who make up 60% of our urban centres, where is the church speaking for, for those networks? Uh, so at that level, it's very important to me because ultimately it's about bringing about social justice and building the kingdom of God, which is one of justice and equality for all. So it has to go beyond, beyond the dialogue to real action, to changing hearts and minds and to defending the weak against a very wicked and oppressive regime that we are dealing with. Thank you very much. Okay, and lastly, Zubeda. Um, yeah, I you know you've, you've been on and off during the yeah, our two hour session. But maybe just just a quick reaction, or rather a parting shot from your end. Like, well, what what do you think? Uh, oh, and she's disappeared again. <laughs> okay, then um, the reason as to why I actually asked that question is because I just wanted us to reflect um, on how best can we improve what we are doing in in the religious uh, space, and how best can we really for more so really work with the communities, more so really work with the Kenyan society to continue empowering them, to continue educating them, to continue, you know, um, helping them really understand uh, our constitution, making them really understand why they need to participate in our, in, in public, uh, for example, public participation forums to make the change that we all want um, in our society at the end of the day. So I just wanted us to have that quick uh, reflection to think about what can we do after this, for example, even after this forum, reflect on it, what can we do moving forward and um, yeah, make our society or rather our Kenyan society a better place, you know, as far as our political even leadership is concerned. So um, I'd just like to say thank you very much for your fruitful uh, discussions. Uh, on behalf of Kondra Dadanawa Foundation, the Kenya office, we are really grateful for all your great insights. We continue to partner with uh, religious actors and CACC is actually one of our main uh, partners as far as the religious angle is concerned. Uh, we hold a lot of seminars with them, we hold a lot of workshops with them, round table discussions and forums just to discuss on how best um, you know, religion, rather religious actors can really get involved in, in the democratization process in this country. And how can we also rope in the grassroots, you know, from the grassroots to the elite level, how can we, you know, uh, balance that and work together towards achieving the common goal of making our country better as far as um, our politics is concerned. So I think that that's pretty much all from our end. I'm grateful again for your insights and also for taking time to just plug in and giving you great insights um, and what you feel we should do moving forward as far as um, participating or rather influencing you know, our leadership, uh, political leadership is concerned. So that's it from our end. Uh, I wish us all a um, good night and thank you very much. Thank you. Nice. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. I just flag like a, a, a wave like that maybe Many of the, your listeners will be just be glad to see that. Thank you so much and have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.